Greetings, and welcome to the Insights Session with Canon Medical, where we offer an exclusive preview to some of our latest AI innovations that help to provide intelligent healthcare. I'm Shelton Carruthers from Canon Medical, and it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers and the topic for this webinar. That topic is artificial intelligence and medical imaging, and specifically, our Advanced Intelligent Clear IQ Engine or ACE technology, and deep learning reconstruction on spectral. With collaborative imaging, Canon focuses on developing cutting edge technology, such as deep learning AI, to address the needs of clinicians to improve patient outcomes through three key areas. First, to provide informed healthcare to the clinicians, our AI solutions have been designed to enhance clinical confidence through high image quality, and applications that help make informed treatment decisions in real time. Second, for patients, our efforts focus the AI-powered solutions to enable fast, accurate results, allowing more personally tailored treatments. And third, recognizing the demanding workload of our partners, we've developed streamlined AI-driven workflows that optimize resources and efficiency. Advanced Intelligent Clear IQ Engine Deep Learning Reconstruction is just one component of the overall approach by Canon Medical toward this intelligent healthcare. This technology reduces image noise while preserving signal and imaging features, but it's not a one size fit all tool applied across all image modalities. Rather, it's actually developed independently for each modality using vast training data sets and a deep understanding of imaging and system physics. So whether applied to spectral CT or MRI, the advanced intelligent clear IQ engine is optimized for that application. To learn a little bit more about ACE applied to CT, MR, and nuclear medicine, please enjoy the following three wonderful collaborators as they present their experience with it. Meanwhile, We'd also like to invite you to peruse the RSNA virtual site where there's a wealth of information for all of our exciting new products, including personalized tours, on-demand presentations from key opinion leaders, AI theater presentations, and lunch and learn sessions with live question and answer. Please join us at canonrsna20.com. Now, without any further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce the speakers for this Insights session. Professor Ohana from Strasbourg University will introduce his initial clinical experience with deep learning spectral CT and ACE. Dr. Kakigi from Kyoto University will discuss ACE in MRI, focusing on his experience in musculoskeletal applications. And Dr. Chen from Canon Medical Research will present the potential of deep learning reconstruction in nuclear medicine imaging. Dr. Ohana, the screen is all yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. It is really my pleasure to speak with you about the usage of deep learning reconstruction in computed tomography. Here are my disclosures. Deep learning reconstruction can seem complex and the science behind it is a bit opaque, but the results and the implementation are very simple because you go from a noisy image to a noiseless image. And the way you use it in your routine everyday work is basically as another layer that is added on top of the usual image reconstruction and acts as a denoiser. So ACE is basically a denoiser. It is very powerful. It is probably the most powerful uh, tool that we have currently, but it is just a denoiser. And the question is, how do we use it? And I have four different points that I wanted to speak about the usage of DLR in computer demography. First, of course, you can use it for image quality. There is already a growing body of evidence in the literature about uh, the usage of DLR. And what is always uh, demonstrated is that the usage of DLR will decrease the noise and increase the signal to noise ratio and contrast to noise ratio. Uh, 
which is, of course, completely expected because the algorithm is designed to reduce the noise. So this is completely normal that it does that. But what is more interesting when you read the article is that when they compare the image quality obtained with DLR with the image quality obtained with hybrid IR or a model-based iterative reconstruction, then you see that the subjective image quality is rated better with DLR than with prior reconstruction techniques. Here is an example. It's an extreme example because this is a very low dose uh, abdomen and pelvis uh, CT with contrast. And when you look at the images, of course, the noise numbers are better with DLR, but it's not only about the numbers, it's also about the appearance. Then the overall appearance of the images, the sharpness of the structure and uh, the uh, enhancement of the parenchyma, the appearance is much better with DLR than it is with MBIR or hybrid IR. And this stands true if you go with regular standard dose acquisition, not only low dose acquisition. Here is a coronary CTA. The appearance is better with DLR. It's a much more natural appearance compared to the plasticky appearance that you get with model-based reconstruction. This stands true also if you compare what you obtain with other vendors. And this is an example in a follow-up uh, of an oncological patient. Then you see that with DLR, you achieve better overall image quality with good and excellent sharpness of the uh, structures and good homogeneous enhancement. Second point, you can use DLR to lower the radiation dose. I think this is quite a good example because we know that the uh, head is difficult to lower the radiation dose because you have so much bone to go through. And if we look at this uh, repeat head CT in an oncological patient over the course of time, then you see that going from second to third then to fourth generation of scanner, you definitely increase the image quality. And if you look at the basal ganglia here, they are much natural and much better with DLR, but you manage to do it with a significant dose reduction. And this is something that we have uh, seen in our department with the implementation of DLR without any specific dedicated optimization of the acquisition protocol, we constantly achieve a 30 to 45% reduction in the overall radiation dose. So this is, in my opinion, already uh, largely enough to justify the use of DLR. Third point, which is also extremely important, is to use DLR to improve the diagnostic performance of your examination. This is where the evidence is lacking in the literature because there are almost no articles uh, that are, are um, focusing on diagnostic performance. They are focusing on numbers, on subjective image quality, but not too much on diagnostic performance. And this is my personal opinion. This is not supported by uh, scientific evidence currently, but my opinion is that DLR could make a difference in challenging cases. And I wanted to share with you today three of these cases. First, in obese patients. So look at this extremely obese patient. 230 kilograms, we were at the maximum dose delivered. This is reconstructed with the usual hybrid IR. This is reconstructed with DLR. There is no question that uh, DLR reconstruction is better and that you get much more confidence in running this image compared to this image. So I'm sure that in obese patients, DLR definitely makes a difference. Second point for DLR can also be very helpful is when you want to look at very small uh, structures and you do a focused small field of view reconstruction. Here is an example of an arterial stent in the renal artery. We wanted to assess if there is instant stenosis. With hybrid IR, very difficult to tell. With DLR, I have no doubt in saying that there is a significant severe instant stenosis. Third example, 
is to use DLR to achieve low KV CTA in single energy. And you can do a CTA at 80 KV without any problem. And in this example, with DLR reconstruction at 80 KV, I can say that this is a type 2 endolic. I'm confident in saying that. Here, it might be just random noise, a bit more difficult. Fourth point where DLR can also make a difference is spectral imaging. In spectral imaging, DLR is not only a denoiser, it's also involved in the energy separation within the raw data, which means that we get improved image quality for the monochromatic reconstruction and also for the module specific images. And look at these examples. When you look at the iodine map, see how homogeneous the enhancement of the iodine is and how sharp the margins are. This is something that you achieve at low KV. Look at these hypervascular arterial uh, hepatic lesions, also seen on effective Z, and also at high KV, which means that you can achieve relatively consistent, good image quality over a wide range of monochromatic levels. Finally, you also get an improved spectral curve. And this is a nice example. You have a hypodense lesion within the inferior vena cava. And when you put a ROI inside it, you see that the spectral curve is completely flat, which means that there is no enhancement. And then you can confidently say that this is a thrombus and not a tumor. To conclude, GLR is available on a wide range of machines, not only the higher end scanners. It is perfectly integrated in the workflow. The initial setup is easy. The usage in the uh, everyday routine is easy. And if you want to use it for more advanced use, it's also very easy. The literature tells us, and this is something that we have witnessed, that DLR is extremely efficient to reduce radiation dose. And by itself, this argument is enough to justify the wide usage of this technique. But, and I think this is really promising, is that DLR is likely to improve your diagnostic performance, as we saw in challenging cases, but it could also be the case in regular everyday cases. And that would be another uh, justification to the wider application of DLR. So thank you for watching this video. So I'm Dr. Kaki from Kyoto University. So today I'd like to talk about the practicality of the new Canon 3 Tesla MRI, a one centurion using real cases with a focus on a musculoskeletal imaging. After that, I'd like to talk a little bit about the neural and the abdominal images as well. Uh, the 3 Tesla Vantage Centurion, the top of the right MRI scanner allows for a new approach to high-resolution imaging uh, based on time-saving imaging techniques and AI-based denoising techniques. Okay, first, let me show you a regulatory image. Uh, this case is a sure normal of the sign. So yellow arrow is a TBR nerve, and the blue arrow is a common perineal nerve. So the distinction uh, between TBR nerve and the common perineal nerve is nicely depicted on sagittal and transverse uh, tissue-weighted image. So STIR image is also very nice. Uh, the image is three millimeter slice thickness, but I think uh, uh, the nerve is uh, depicted well. So tumor appears so to be derived from TBR nerve and common perineal nerve. So this is another sure normal case of the elbow. And uh, this originates from Arna nab. Uh, the, the Arna nab is uh, very delineated and can be traced easily. So as you can see, even regular 2D images can be quite high quality. So next, I'll show you a regular 3D image. So we scan this using 3D fast saturated MPB-like space image and created SRAM MIP. So I think you can see clearly to the periphery of the brachia plexus. So this case is a brachia plexus schwannoma. This image clearly shows which nerve 
uh, roots are associated with the tumor. I think it's a very beautiful image. So here, so let's consider why high resolution imaging is needed in the musculoskeletal radiology. For example, a rotator cuff in the labral tears may be difficult to detect and diagnose with conventional resolution. High resolution imaging is necessary to facilitate recognition of injury pattern and location. So there are uh, many, many approaches to obtain the images to high resolution. So simply, so increasing the resolution uh, resulting in a decrease in SNL. So increasing the number of image acquisition average would improve the SNL, but would also extend the scan time. So excessive setting would not be acceptable in clinical practice. So surface coils have made it possible to obtain high resolution images, but they are limited evaluation with narrower OB and do not allow imaging of the entire knee. So ideally, the entire knee joint should be scanned with a resolution equal to or better than that of the surface coil. Okay, here, so let me introduce you to ACE. So ACE, so which stands for Advanced Intelligent Korea IQ Engine, is the world's first deep learning reconstruction technology and to be implemented in a product by Canon. So deep learning reconstruction is a noise reduction reconstruction technique using deep learning. So by adapting deep learning reconstruction to images with low SNR, so SNR can be greatly improved. So let me tell you about the denoting effect by ACE. So simply, so increasing the resolution would result in a decrease in SNR. So, but increasing the number of the image acquisition average would improve the SNR. So, but it would also extend the scan time. So by using ACE, the scan time is equivalent to the average one. So, and the SNL is equivalent to that of the average 10. The main feature of ACE is that it selectively reduces the noise only. In general, so smoothing filter can also remove the noise, but it produces blur. The sharpness of the image is reduced at the same time as the noise. Uh, so the comparison with the original image shows a Contour of the image has been removed in addition to the noise. However, so ACE shows that only noise has been removed in comparison to the original image. So as you can see, ACE has a noise reduction performance. Okay, now let's take a look at the difference in the region delineation uh, between 2D and the 3D images. Uh, this is a, a case of osteonecrosis of the femur and tibia. So rest side is a 3D saturated MPB image like space. Uh, right side is a one millimeter 2D saturated proton density weighted image with S. So previously, a uh, one millimeter 2D image would be challenging, uh, but S makes it amazing possible. The 2D image depicts the bone marrow edema like this, but the 3D image uh, does not adequately depict it. Uh, my impression is that 2D image is better than 3D image in terms of depicting bone marrow edema. The scan time for 2D and 3D images is almost the same, uh, but the resolution and the tissue contrast in 2D image are better than in 3D image. Okay, I'll show you a 1 millimeter 2D image. Uh, this is a case of uh, rotator cuff tears and wrong head of biceps tendon injury. Uh, the original image is a colon image, and we created such tour and transverse image by MPR. Thus, so it, it's impossible to create two MPR images with one millimeter size thickness and high resolution. Okay, the same patient, the subscapulous tendon tear is depicted in the detail on the coronal and the transverse image, uh, yellow arrow. So you can see that a wrong head of the biceps tendon is trapped 
within the torn subscapulis tendon. And the wrong head of the biceps tendon injury is depicted on the transverse and the sagittal MPR images, so red arrow. The same patient uh, whose thickness tear of the supraspinatus tendon is nicely delineated on the coronal image. Coronal image also depicts the entirety of the injury of the long head of biceps tendon. So another patient, so this is a comparison of images of three millimeter and one millimeter with ACE in a case of intrasubstance tear of subscapulous tendon. In the case of the subscapulous tendon tears, three millimeter coronal image can show the region, but usually just one slice. So it's difficult to diagnose the region uh, with certainty. Okay, however, so one millimeter coronal image can point out the region with continuity here. So, and that's make a pretty confident diagnosis. So, of course, the region can be pointed out even one, uh, one millimeter transverse NPR image. So, if the region can be pointed out from the two different directions, so I think we can be more confident in the diagnosis. Okay, second case is a recurrence of the giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath. Uh, the region is uh, well visible uh, on some three millimeter image. This may be enough to evaluate it, but the region is more detailed on the one millimeter 2D image. So you can see the region not only around the tendon, uh, but also near the DIP joint. So we can also see the width uh, of the region on image. So this is a neat case. So you can see horizontal tear uh, posterior root in the med medial meniscus and the parameniscus cyst associated with tear on the coronal image. And as you can see the metal in tibia here, so you may have noticed a reduction in metal artifact. So it may be because the increased resolution in frequency direction reduces the pixel size and the visibility of the artifact and decreased thread thickness reduces the thread distortion. So tear in the paramenscus cyst uh, nicely depicted on the one millimeter transverse and the sagittal reconstruction images. So as you can see, the region can be seen in three directions. Okay, this is another knee case. The cartilage injury is clearly depicted on the transverse uh, NPR image. I don't show it here, so but in 3D, it's almost it's almost impossible to detect if there is an injury or not. So with regard to cartilage injury, I believe that 2D image is more clearly delineated than 3D image. Okay, so today so I introduced the usefulness of 2D synth right image with ACE in the musculoskeletal radiology. The main feature of ACE is that it selectively reduces noise and it's independent of the examination part, sequence, parameter, core type, and contrast. So therefore, it can be adapted at various parts of the body and the sequences. So lastly, I'd like to briefly introduce our efforts and accomplishments as a musculoskeletal area at Kyoto University. Okay, first of all, let me show you to systemography in the neuroradiology. Uh, this high resolution image with ACE so can be obtained in short time. It may be suitable for detecting cranial nerves and aneurysms. Okay, this study was conducted by Mr. Sagawa. He's a radiologic technologist at Kyoto University Hospital. So in a study on the depiction, diffusion tensor tractography in pyramidal tract. So diffusion tensor tractography in pyramidal tract in the average one with ACE was as well delineated as in average five. Just so it makes, ACE makes it possible to depict tractography in short time. 
So next, I show you the abdominal case. This is a 3D MR coronal pancreatography scanned with breast hold. High spatial resolution uh, is required to obtain the nice MRCT. So by using not only ACE, but also fast 3D technique, high speed technique, a nice image can be obtained in a short time, 26 seconds. So this is a case of the common bariatric stone here. So as you can see, the stone is clearly depicted and the mildly dilated intrahepatic bariatric is also depicted to the periphery. Okay, this is a case of the river transplantation donor candidate. So it provides necessary information for transplantation including the morphological and anatomical evaluation of the bile duct, portal vein, and the hepatic vein. So unlike MRCP, so high spatial resolution is not always necessary to obtain so MR photography and MR venography. So as long as the, the accessory hepatic vein of five millimeter, five millimeter or more can be delineated, it's okay. So we can get enough information from MR photography and MR venography with even breast hold. Okay, this is a summary. So first, by using ACE, high resolution images with high SNL can be obtained without extending the scan time. So second, by using ACE, it's possible to scan to the one minute images with high SNL in a practical time. So which have not been possible previously and improve the diagnostic performance. So lastly, is selectively removes noise only. So it's highly versatile and it is, it's expected to be applied to site and sequence in the future. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, many people. So thank you for your attention. My name is Jen Chen. Today I'm going to talk to you about advances in deep learning based imagery restoration for pets. Many factors can impact image noise, such as a patient's BMI, injected dose, optic time, and etc. Therefore, it has been a significant challenge to achieve consistent image quality across different patients on a PET scanner. For example, these are the original OSEM reconstructions of three patient studies acquired at the two imaging centers on our latest Cartesian Prime SIPM scanner. These st studies were acquired with low dose protocol, so these raw images are fairly noisy. The first two US patients had a two substantially different BMI but acquired with nearly identical acquisition protocol. We can see that the bigger patient is corrupted with a higher level of noise than the smaller patient as reflected by the standard deviation in the liver. On the other hand, although patient two and patient three had a similar BMI, but these two institutions used different scan protocol. Therefore, the noise is quite different. As seen in these examples, the PET image quality are highly dependent on patient size and scan protocol settings. Conventional filters such as Gaussian can be used to reduce noise as reflected as the standard deviation in the liver. However, it doesn't differentiate between signal and noise. On these patients, we can see about 18 to 40% decrease in SUV mean in the FDG evolutions in these cases. When we flip the slides back and forth, it can be noticed that some small lesions are smeared out by the Gaussian filter. In addition, it also does not adapt to different noise level in the input which means if the input is noisier, then the output will also be noisier. To reduce the patient size protocol dependency, and therefore producing high quality image consistently across different patients, we train a neural network to adapt to different noise level into input images. This is achieved by noise adaptive training. We pair a bunch of low quality images derived from the same study 
Each of them represent the same subject, but corrupted with different level of noise. To a single high quality image, since the network needs to minimize the differences between all these low quality images and the high quality target, at the same time, the network is trying to adapt to different noise level in the data automatically. Such that when the input is noisier, it knows that it has to apply a stronger smoothing. In contrast, if the input is less noisy, the neural network will smooth less. This training allows the neural network to always achieve a more consistent high quality image. Let's revisit the sample patients that we have seen before. For the large size patient, the DRR further reduced the liver standard deviation to 5.7% compared to the 9.4% in the Gaussian filtered image. Here are the zoomed in views on the FDG additions. So this is the original OSEM image and the Gaussian filtered image and the DRR images. We can see that the DRR preserved the SUV mean in these lesions, that is almost the same as the input OSEM images. For the smaller patient, the LR produced images with similar liver standard deviation at 5.2%, while preserving the lesion SUV the same as the original OSEM reconstruction. It is also worth to note that the sharpness of other fine structures have also been well preserved. Similar improvements are also observed in this Japanese patient. The LR reduced the liver standard deviation to 4% while preserving the SUV values very close to the original OSEM reconstruction in these sample lesions. These lesions are also appear to be sharper than the Gaussian filtered image. In summary, deep learning-based image restoration is a DCNN technique that can effectively differentiate signal from noise in PET images. Our experiment results suggest that noise adaptive training may reduce patient size or scan protocol dependency and produce high quality image consistently. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the talk. I would like to thank each of our guests for their presentations and you for your time and attention. I hope you found it enlightening and that it's piqued your interest. Please join us at Canon Medical's virtual booth at canonrsna20.com, where you can get exclusive insights into our latest innovations across all modalities and discover how Canon Medical can help you harness the power of intelligent healthcare with our collaborative imaging solutions that are made for life. We look forward to welcoming you on our booth.